All right, we have Jay Tower with us, and Jay is going to talk about death to the CMS. And that's going to be that's interesting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean the CMS, no ill will. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personal, it's just business. <laughs> that's right, exactly. All that's right. right. Whenever you're ready. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. All right, All right so, so yeah, let's talk about death to the CMS. I hope everyone's enjoying .NET Conf 2019 so far. I know I am. I uh, just enjoyed watching Jeffrey Palermo about DevOps. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about updatable static sites for .NET developers. As the guys mentioned, my name is Jonathan Tower. I go by Jay. I'm a partner and a principal consultant at Trailhead Technology Partners. We're a Microsoft Gold partner. We do a lot of custom software application development for our clients. So if anything we talk about today or any of that stuff uh, is something interesting to you, these are places you can reach out to me online, and I'd be happy to connect about anything. And down at the bottom, too, I've got a GitHub link, which I'll show again at the end of the presentation, where you can actually get the slides for this presentation that I'm showing right now. All right, so let's jump into it. Uh, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what is a static site generator, why you might want to use one of them. I'm going to give you some examples of a few different popular ones, uh, both non.NET technology ones and then some of the more popular .NET based ones. Uh, I've selected one of those, which is called YM, that I'm going to do a few demos in, including some demos of the command line interface, what it might look like, if you're developing a static site on your local development environment. And then building off of some of the things Jeffrey was just talking about with Azure DevOps, uh, I've created a DevOps pipeline, which responds to uh, some new code being checked into a repository and runs a static site generator, and builds that content out to an Azure, um, to an Azure blob storage, actually, that's acting as a website. And then uh, we'll wrap it up with uh, some further investigation topics. If you're interested in learning more about this, some, some recommendations I can make uh, for where to do that. And then hopefully we'll have a little time for, for some Q&A at the end. So we'll start out with what is a static site generator. If you're not familiar with them already, uh, it basically allows you to compromise between a hand-coded static website and a full-blown CMS. If you're not familiar with CMSs, uh, some popular ones out there like uh, WordPress, it's a content management system. It allows more non-technical users to actually create content, have that a content go through potentially an approval process, and then have that content eventually find its way out to a live website. Uh, static site generators allow you to basically generate HTML and CSS files from themes and template files, such as Markdown, for example. They also then allow you to transfer those files to a web server and then have that server basically doing what it's really good at, which is serving static files to users that are requesting them. So just to kind of map that out a little bit, what that looks like, a lot of us are probably uh, developers or web developers, and we're kind of used to what the uh, dynamic web application lifecycle looks like. So all of this happens at request time. A user is going to go make a request to one of our sites or applications. Uh, if that's like a CMS or if it's a ASP.NET Core application, that's going to run some sort of an executable on the server. That executable is going to go with some predefined templates, let's say maybe like Razor Pages in the case of ASP.NET Core, and maybe connect to the database and get some additional data, basically merge that all together and build it into a response to go back to the user. But all at request time, so all that processing has to happen on the web server for each request. Now, when we're talking about a static site that's been uh, generated, uh, there's kind of two different time frames. There's the compile time frame and then the request time. Uh, so let's look at the compile time frame first. You will start with templates and content files, and you would run that at compile time through a generator. 
And that generator would actually create your website as static files in some sort of a folder structure. You can then take that set of folders and files and upload them to your web server. And now when a user requests at request time, one of those pages, it's going to just be served from the web server as a static file. So why would you want to use static sites instead of the dynamic sites? The dynamic sites can kind of do all of that. It could be static, it could be dynamic. Uh, so why would you want to limit yourself in that way? Well, the main two reasons are faster and cheaper. So nothing for a web server is faster than serving just a static file. As sort of a case study, I took a site uh, recently that was running on a CMS and I was getting about one and a half to two and a half second response times, especially uh, two and a half seconds the first time someone would come to that site. I was able to, to just make that uh, same site a static site and get those response times down to like 250 milliseconds. So definitely a, an order of magnitude faster. Uh, and if you think about that from your user's experience perspective, uh, that could be very significant. Uh, especially if they're moving from page to page and seeing that uh, that increase repeatedly. And then the second reason, nothing is cheaper. So with that same site, I was paying about $40 a month to host that and moved it over to an Azure uh, blob storage, which you can now set up as a, web, a public website and was able to get actually a slight increase in the traffic that that site was seeing. And it still went from that $40 a month price to less than a dollar a month, um, just because it's so much cheaper to host those static files and serve those static files. All right, so I wanna review with you, if you haven't heard of uh, static site generators before, um, I wanna review some of the more popular ones that are out there. First, starting with the ones that are not uh, .NET based. Uh, you might've heard of some of these if you're into this space at all, Jekyll is a very popular one. It's based in Ruby and it uses a template language called Liquid. Uh, there's another one called Hexo, which is JavaScript or Node.js based. And one of its real strong points, as you can see here in this chart, uh, this table here is that it uses all kinds of different template formats. Um, so if you're interested in flexibility, that might be a good option for you. Uh, then moving on to Gatsby. Uh, if you're a React person, if you like React for your web UI framework uh, for JavaScript, then you're going to really lo love Gatsby because it's using uh, JavaScript as its uh, runtime, and it's also using uh, React for its templating. Uh, Go is a popular language right now that's uh, really known for being highly performant. And uh, Hugo is cool because it uses Go for both its um, underlying technology and for the templates that you build. Uh, and then finally, Nux.js is based on JavaScript and Node.js. And if you're a Vue.js person, if you like that for your front-end UIs in JavaScript, uh, you would really love this because it uses Vue for its templates. Now, switching over to the .NET world, uh, these are all uh, static site generators written in .NET. Uh, first of all, YAM, uh, that one actually uses Razor syntax for its templates and Markdown as well. Uh, so if you're familiar with either of those, that can be really useful. Uh, Razor, if you're not familiar with it, is the same technology ASP.NET MVC uses for its pages as, as well as Razor pages uh, use for its UI views. Uh, then Pretzel is also using Liquid. Uh, so if you are interested in using the Liquid template, but doing it on a .NET technology, you can use Pretzel. Grays uh, offers just Razor. And then there's another one called Iron Beard as well that's uh, .NET based, which uses Razor and Markdown like YM does. Now I'm gonna focus uh, from now on, I'm gonna do some demos. I'm gonna show you guys uh, YM. I picked that one to kind of delve down into. So. Let's jump into that. We're gonna start out with a demo of using YM as a, at the command line interface. So I'll go ahead and open my command line here. And to start out with, I'll just make this a little bigger for readability. And I'm just gonna do a directory listing. You can see there's actually nothing in this directory right now. Now before the session today, I went ahead and installed YM just so that we didn't have to wait for that. 
But if you wanted to install it yourself and you've got the .NET CLI installed already, it's a .NET tool, which means you can install it using the .NET command line. So I could do .NET tool install dash G, which means I'm installing it globally and do ym.tool. Now, if I do this right now, you're gonna see an error message that says that that's already installed, like I mentioned. So I don't need to do that again. But uh, now with it installed, I can use the ym command. And as a subcommand, I'm going to start with the new subcommand and say I want to build a new uh, project in this directory. And I'm going to use the dash r flag here to indicate what recipe to use and specify blog as the recipe type. So recipe is kind of like what type of website um, am I building? Um, if it's a blog website with content pages, the blog template is a good one to use. You could do an ebook template uh, or recipe. Um, there's also like an online documentation recipe that you could use um, and several others that you can find online as well. So if I go ahead and run that, we see the YM uh, ASCII art logo appear. And then you can see it's detecting that there's no input directory or configuration file. That's creating both of those. Downloading some NuGet packages for YM to my global uh, packages folder and um, finally cleaning up a temp folder that it used. So if I do a directory listing now, we can see that there are a couple things in this folder. There's a configuration file for YM, and there's also an input directory. So if I switch to that input directory, you can see a markdown file called about and another directory called posts. So if we switch into that and do a listing, you can see there's another markdown file in here called first post that markdown. So basically I've got a blog post, a single blog post in here, and I've got a single page called about in this directory, in the input directory. And that's basically it. Uh, that's the input files that I would edit or add to, to create a YM based site. Now, if I want to actually build that site, uh, I can use the YM command again. The subcommand to build it is build, or actually the build subcommand is the default. So if I'm just trying to do a build, I don't actually have to specify build, I can skip that. Now I'm going to specify again that I wanna use the recipe called blog. And this time I'm gonna also specify a theme, which is the dash T flag. Now what a theme is, is basically within the blog style of site or blog type of project, uh, I can have all kinds of different themes. Uh, themes are like how it visually looks, what the layout of the pages is, uh, what assets are included as far as images and CSS or third-party libraries. Um, so there's one that's built into YM called Clean Blog, and I'm going to use that just as a starting point here. All right, so I went ahead and ran that build command. You can see it's... Um, actually locating my configuration file, looking for the NuGet packages, and now it's actually running through the build steps, through the build pipeline. And if I do a directory listing again, uh, you see there's a bit more in the folder now than there was before, including this output directory. So if we switch to the output directory and do a listing, uh, you see what should look fairly familiar to any of us web developers, a bunch of basic site uh, root folder type of files. So I've got my about page. Um, I've also got a post a posts folder. And if I change directory to that and look, you can see there's an index page in there as well as a first post uh, .html. So I'm going to go back up to the YM folder. And I also want to open this up in uh, Visual Studio Code a minute. So you can see a little bit of what's in these files. All right, so if I look at the uh, configuration file, uh, it's basically, it, lo it looks like C-sharp code because it is C-sharp code. Uh, so I'm able to set any kind of global settings or configuration here. And then if we look at any of the markdown files, if you're familiar with markdown, um, these are gonna look pretty familiar to you. The only thing that's a little different is above these three dashes is sort of like the header for this YM file. I can specify some of the metadata about this document or blog post in this case, like its title, the date that it's published, um, and any tags I want to include on that. 
those are all things that are defined by the recipe. In this case, we're using the blog recipe. So title, published, and tags are all things that the blog recipe knows how to handle. Now, if I uh, go into the configuration, I want to change one setting in here. So I'm going to say settings, and it's keys.linkhide extensions, and I want to set that to false. So basically, what this is going to do, this is going to allow me to view these, uh, to view this site on my local development environment uh, by making all of the links from one page or one post to another. I use the .html extension at the end of the names, at the end of the paths, um, so that they'll work on my local development environment. All right, so now I'm going to tell YM to build again with the blog recipe and the clean blog theme. And then when that finishes running, I can actually uh, do a preview mode where YM will open up a web browser for me. And I can do that, or I'm sorry, a web server for me. I can do that by doing YM preview. And you can see now the output from this says I can go to localhost 5080. So I'm going to pull my web browser over here and go to that. And you can see now that I get my page. If I go to the about page, you can see that that's working. And if I go to the first post that was defined, you can see that that has been uh, created as well. So this is kind of nice, uh, handy to use for uh, development time to see how my site is working when I generate it. Uh, it would be really nice if I could basically just run that in the background to make changes in Visual Studio Code and have it update automatically. And I can do that um, by just doing uh, YM dash uh, preview, uh, I'm sorry, dash watch, dash preview. And now it's going to actually watch that directory. I can make a change in the directory at any time uh, to any of the input files, and it's going to automatically update that um, on the site. So if I open that browser back up again and go to the first post, for example, now that it's running in watch mode, I can go edit this and change the post to say, hello world, and save it. And now if I flip back over to the browser without even refreshing, you can see it's already updated to hello world. All right, so now I want to show you one more thing, which is how to integrate static site building into a Azure DevOps pipeline. Some of the stuff that Jeffrey was just showing us uh, in Azure DevOps. So if I pull uh, my Azure DevOps project over here, I can show you that I've got a repo set up. And it's got, as you can see, it's got a, a YM site in it, including the input. So it's the same basic template that we were just working with. And now if I go open that, um, I'm going to open that in Visual Studio Code. Uh, so it's the same code that we were just looking at, basically. And I have also set up a build pipeline to run YM, and then a release pipeline to copy the output folder of that into an Azure blob storage. That Azure blob storage right now is up at this uh, static site here, uh, which if I just refresh, you can see if I click around, it's, uh, it's currently working. So what I want to do is I want to add a second post to my site, a second blog post. So I can easily do that here by just creating a new folder in my a new file in my posts folder. I'm going to call it secondpost.md. And then I've got some content that I'm going to borrow here from another file, which is just some basic um, some basic content that you might have um, for Markdown. Just basic Markdown sample file here, basically. Okay. Now I'll save that. And if I go into my choice, you can see here that I've got a change. So I'm going to go ahead and stage that change. And then I'll say I'm adding a second post. 
and push that into my repo. Now while that's building, while that's pushing, let me look at the actual repo here, which now if we look at the build, you can see that it's actually queued a build to run with that add second post as the trigger for it. And if I actually go in here, I can actually see as the agent spins up, I can see what's happening. But I actually want to go to the build definition a second so that I can show you guys uh, what that looks like. So it's really simple. This is an Azure hosted agent, which means that it's going to be a potentially a new agent every time. If I hosted this on a server or virtual machine that I owned, uh, I could actually skip this first step, which is installing the YAM tool. Um, this adds about a minute to the build time. So um, it would be great if I could do this on my own hosted agent, um, that I, uh, my own custom agent that I hosted, and I could skip this step. It would save me about a minute. The second step here is just running YAM. So if you look at this command, this very similar command to what we've just been running at the command line interface. And when it's done, I'm just publishing the output directory into a drop folder, an artifact called drop, so that I can grab that in my release. Now, if we look at the release, I'll show you the definition of that as well. So this is basically just going to look for any changes that happen in my uh, static sites build anytime a build completes. And I've got it enabled for the continuous deployment trigger, meaning anytime that happens, it's going to constantly deploy automatically. And then if I look at the actual jobs that are happening, it's basically just one step. And that is to copy the contents of that drop folder to an Azure blob that I've defined, which you can see is that same name of the site that we, um, we were looking at a second ago. And it's going to copy it into the dollar sign web folder, which happens to be the one that you want to use if you're hosting a static site on an Azure blob. And uh, let's go see how that build is actually doing. So the build is still uh, is running the YM step right now. Um, so you can see it actually does take a minute to run through all of that. And now it's publishing the artifacts to the drop folder. And so now if we switch over to the release, we should see the release pick up that in just a second. It looks like maybe it finished already. Uh, now here it goes. So that release is currently queued. In just a second here, this release will uh, get an agent available from Azure DevOps, and it'll actually copy those that content. Uh, here you go. You can see it's waking up now. And it's going to download the artifacts, uh, the drop artifacts that I defined. And now it's actually running my Azure blob file copy command. And in just a moment here, it'll have copied all of those files over to the Azure blob storage. And we'll be able to go refresh that site and see that we've got that second post on there. While we're waiting for that to happen, though, let me actually show you my further investigation topics if you're interested in learning more about this. Staticgen.com is a great resource. It talks about all these different static site generators, helps you compare and contrast them, um, the different features that they have, the different technologies that they're built using. Uh, if you're interested in getting the advantages of uh, CMS without the speed slowdown of one, a headless CMS might be the right choice for you. It basically gives you the advantage of the back end part of the CMS while still having the site be a statically generated site. Um, so headless CMS org is a great place to start with that. My demos have been with ym.io. Uh, you can go to uh, ym.io to check that out. And then if you're interested in actually building applications using static sites, you want to check out something called the Jam Stack, which is jamstack.org. Basically brings JavaScript and uh, REST APIs to play on these static sites and creates, uh, helps you turn them into actual custom applications. All right, let's go check our site here real quick and see if it's up and running. And you can see it has now generated the second post. And if I click on it, I can see the content there that was generated from that markdown file. 
So it worked perfectly. And that brings us to the question and answers. So does anyone have any questions I can help address? All right. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, we got a couple questions. So Great. the question was asked, um, what's the impact on SEO when you're creating static files? Is it better? Or is, what's the impact? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there's a couple of impacts off the top of my head. Uh, one of them is one of the things that um, SEO uh, search engines are concerned with, such as Google and Bing, is how fast and performant your site is. So, by making it a static site uh, versus a CMS, you're very likely to have a pretty significant speed increase, which means that your your sort of points or your score with the search engines is likely to go up. Uh, one thing to think about, though, when you're if you're migrating from a CMS to static sites, is that you do want to try and keep all of your URLs the same. Uh, so if you have sites that are currently at you know yoursite.com/blog/blogtitle, you'd want to try and configure your static site generator to regenerate all of those same uh, URL paths, so that if a user visits uh, a link to an old blog that was on your CMS, it's still going to work on your statically generated site. Great. And then what about YM performance for compiling very large sites, like doc sites? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So obviously, um, the performance decreases as the site in, in size increases. Uh, one of the ways that you could address that is to actually break it up into pieces so that if someone checks in a change and it's to uh, you know one of 17 different areas that you have, uh, uh, major content areas that you have on your site, you could actually make that one site that generates and then have um, the other 16 sections of your site not regenerate because of that. Uh, that's a good approach. All right, great. Hey, Jay, thanks so much for doing this. This was awesome. Yeah, my pleasure. And Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. We're going to take a break, and then we'll be back with Maddie talking about Xamarin. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you guys in a bit. <clears throat>